morning. Uh, welcome to Hashtag Got Money. I'm Elizabeth Jackson. So I went, you know, I'm on a wee mission to dismantle the jargon of money. And I really wanted to get you some information that what I felt was really important considering what we're in. And as you all know, the climate changes rapidly. So I went to Money Magazine and I, uh, I found this incredible journalist. And I thought I was only going to interview a journalist until I'd started doing my research on this particular guest and I'm blown away. So let me just read some information. Our guest today is Julian Newbold. She is the appointed editor at large at Money Magazine. She, let me say, I'm gonna to read to you. Uh, Newbold brings more than 20 years of experience to the magazine. Previously, she was marketing and communications at BT Financial Group, where she founded Stalin Network. And in the middle of doing all of that, she went ahead and she wrote The Joy of Money. So I'm really intrigued to get to know Julia. Um, Julia Newbold, welcome to Hashtag Got Money. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. So The Joy of Money. Um, do you remember that book back in the 60s? Was it The Joy of Sex? I read the, I read the title and I thought, yeah, that's a great title. The Joy of Money. That is exactly what we thought. We thought, remember that book? Because a lot of people of a certain age had sightings of that book somewhere where their parents had probably hidden it. Oh, yes. And we thought it'll strike something. I looked at it and thought, I'm sure I saw that somewhere lingering under my mother's bed. Um, so talk to me about the book because I'm really interested to know more about that. What was the catalyst in writing the book? So I guess the catalyst was for me, um, you know, heading towards 50 and thinking, you know, how long do I have to stay in this job? When can I do something really creative that I'd like to do? Um, you know, talking to other friends and finding that they wanted to work less or move out of the city or do all sorts of other things, change careers completely. And everything came down to money. You know, whatever decision that needed to be made, it wasn't, really thought of as a money decision but at some point it became one woman uh and money it almost feels like it should they're polar opposites of each other doesn't it we were kind of well, don't you it think does, but it shouldn't because I know. women need money all the time we we're always trying to make things balance you know can we afford that can we not afford that we're having a little budget going on in our head all the time but yet yeah, when it's like money and finance, somehow women disengage. And for me, the best way to sort of explain that is I get money. I've worked in the industry for a long time, so that doesn't disengage me. But once I start thinking of IT or cars and how to run cars and when something goes wrong and I have no idea what the mechanic's telling me or, you know, if it's an IT issue, it just gets beyond me at some point and I just go blank. That kind of reminds me how other people must feel about finance and we want to break that down. I think the other thing too is there's been the, that professional space is predominantly being owned by men and um, I noticed that you set up Stella. Yeah, the Stellar Network was set up to get more women into financial planning because the idea of that was that when you talk about, you know, something as personal as your finances and what you hope to get from them, you really need to have someone that you feel understands you. And we thought that it's not just women, it's diversity. You want people who, who get you and speak the same language to be able to help you. And we, well, you know, we thought as business and as ourselves, that financial advice is good for people. But if you're sitting opposite someone who has nothing in common with you, it's very difficult to get that um, grounding to start with. Yeah, because it's all about personal connection before anything else, isn't it? Absolutely. But you've got to trust the practitioner. Let's unpack that book a little bit yeah. more. Um, who are your readers? I guess um, we really set up to... Um, to direct the book to women because we think that women are often behind um, men in the earnings gap, um, in what they retire on. And women seem to be asking for more help. You know, when they don't understand something, a woman will, will not be afraid to ask the questions that might be, you know, might think they're stupid. But we wanted to just 
not simplify it in ideas, but just take the jargon out. Yeah, I love that. So what have you concentrated on? Have you, what, what's the journey in reading the book? So the journey is really, you know, what do you want to achieve? We want women to have financial independence because it's so important to just be able to make your own decisions, whether you're in a relationship or not. You need to have some level of independence that you feel comfortable with. You need to know where the money is. And, you know, we've talked to a lot of people in relationships and one person typically takes charge of the money and that's fine, but both people really need to understand it. You know, you need to understand where the money is, what your hopes are, whether you're both on the, the same journey, you know, whether ultimately you want the same result. And that's just so important. So we want to make it that people understand, you know, if they want to invest, they understand the stock market, the different things that you can invest in. We want people to understand the ideas of risk. Uh, we want people to be able to make decisions about insurance, um, superannuation, and you know, just get a bit of savings and budgeting tips in there. Is it an enjoyable read? I can imagine. I read something that you wrote this morning and I was giggling. I could imagine that it's an enjoyable read. I think so. I think it's it, it's an easy read, you know, and you don't have to read, you know, right through it necessarily. You can just dip in and out of um, sections that are particularly relevant to you at the moment. You know, there's ideas about, you know, writing a will, getting a family involved in finance. And do, you think women, to... do you think women are risk adverse financially? Yes. Yeah, all the research does say that. And that can be a good thing. I mean, especially now. But whatever the risk is, it, it's personal. You know, if something might be a good idea because you might get a good return in a few years time but you can't sleep at night that risk is too much for you yeah because sleeping at night has to be a priority on everything doesn't it yeah do we research more as women i think do we spend more time getting to the bottom of something than our male and counterparts exactly, yes yes we are earning less our superannuation um is vastly um less than our male counterparts when do we start considering our financial welfare? I think 50 is too late, don't you agree? Oh, it is too late. But before that, there's so many other priorities. You know, that people, are, you don't think you're getting close to retirement until you hit those milestones, I think. Um, you know, if you start at 20, putting in some extra money into your superannuation, the compound interest on that alone, even if it's just in cash, will show so much more than if you started in your thirties or forties. So the, get into it early is the absolute benefit here, isn't it? It is. It is. Um, and so we think, uh, you know, even if older women are buying the book, they should be showing it to their daughters or other women in their lives or even other men in their lives. Is it too late for a 50 year old woman to pick up the book? No. Okay. What are, what are the benefits to the 50 year old reader? I think um, we have some examples of how other women have structured their finances and why they are where, where they are. So whether they've put kids through private schools or they've had a divorce or they've moved or whatever. And we want to say, just start today. Like, don't worry about whatever's happened in the past. Don't beat yourself up over what you think might have been a bad decision because it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, you are here and start from here. Um, and we also just wanted to give examples of people because everybody's different. You know, some people will be better off than you and some people will be worse off than you. But actually, it doesn't matter. You can only do what you can do and what you feel comfortable doing. But we just hope that people get something out of it and in some way you benefit. I think you know, that's great. To write a will or something that, you know, that you've sorted something out. I think that's great that nobody's, that everybody's, everybody can get involved in it. You know, that's the thing. We get to 50 and, or even 40 and hit the financial panic button, don't we? And often what happens inside that space is just some enormous financial mistakes. I think it's great to have a, a, a place that you can go to start. And I think the joy of money is a good place to start, don't you? I do, yeah. Do and you like how I did that? I think it's a good place to start, don't you, Julie? <laughs> we want it to be joyful. We want, you know, we don't want people to see money and go, oh, you know, I don't want to deal with that. 
Yeah, because the deal is if you don't deal with it, you end up impoverished. You know, um, I talk to, I get a lot of people on the show and one of my favourite is Jeanette Large from WPI and there's a lot of homelessness with women and I'm yes. a real advocate in getting in the way of that. Um, and it, it's an unexpected homelessness. And when I asked her about that, she said, you know, our stats aren't even correct because a lot of them so far um, surf. They stay at some friends for a while and then they go to another friends. So I think the only way that you get in, 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 in the way of that or just disrupt that is to start to just start to think critically about your financial position and to have a book to go to that's being primarily engineered and put together by women is actually, thank you for doing that and congratulations. Editor at Large Money Magazine, you write some incredible content. I was having a giggle this morning. You were, you were writing something about the wills and then at the top of it, you've got a checklist of things that you must do before you commence the journey. And number one was grab a glass of wine. And I thought, oh my God, this woman speaks my language. You're involved in the ever moving space of money right now. What are you noticing through um, your dealings and writing for the magazine? People are really hungry for information right now. Um, one of the big issues is should people take money out of their super at the moment? And, you know, that is that is a big issue and probably a lot of people should get advice if they're thinking of it. Um, the government's just allowed financial advisors to provide that advice um, as a one-off and charge no more than $300 for it. And they affects it at different ages if you do take the money out of your super is that for one you miss the compound interest and anything else you would have earned on that money i mean they've done some surveys and figured out that if you're 25 and um you take out the twenty thousand dollars 10 now and 10 in the next financial year that could have an impact when you you retire at one hundred and forty thousand dollars or something like that um also, if you're young and you take the money out, you've likely taken quite a big hit on your super because if you're in a default fund, it's probably um, invested in a lot of growth investments, which um, are primarily equities. So you'll be taking it out at the worst time. If it stays in and the market moves up, you will benefit from that. But saying that, if you really have no alternative than to take the money out of your super, if you're young, you do have more time to make that up. But uh, what about older people? Um, well, it, it, maybe you've taken a lesser hit if your um, money isn't all in equities, and maybe you can take out some of the cash component if you have it. Um, it's a very difficult time for people, and if you really do need the money, absolutely you must take it. But if you can do with maybe not the full 10,000 now, maybe take out, a, you know, three or 4,000 now because there's only a couple more months till the end of the financial year and then you can take out another 10, you know, just be careful in, in what you're taking out. Um, and then if this is a long-term issue, you will be retiring if you're older with less than you expected and there are things that, you know, you may have to consider. You may have to consider working longer in some capacity, trying to, I don't know, make money out of a, a side hustle that you may have or... Um, so to really consider, before you take that out, really give it consideration. And if you don't have to, don't do it. That's really what you're saying, isn't it? Yeah. Um, you, you wrote an article about bankruptcy. Do you think we're gonna see more of that over the next coming months? Um, Again, it's hard to say, possibly not. The government um, measures that have been put in place will hopefully prevent that. And if the banks are working with people um, to halt their loans for a little while, we might get through this period without seeing that. Um, for small businesses that are hit, I think that's quite difficult. But again, if they can just make it through this short period, and you know, try and think about what will happen when we do reopen things um, to see whether the business is likely to still be viable. I guess that's all you can do right now. You talked in one of your articles about businesses being quite nimble. 
I've been writing a series of articles called Making It Work. And one of the businesses that I interviewed recently was a woman who was a wine marketer and she would go around to restaurants and pubs and so on with wine. And um, when they all closed, she found that a lot of these businesses had an excess stock of wine and was just sitting there. And she decided that she could get into business with a mate and they could buy up all that wine from the restaurants and the distributors and so on and sell it to individuals who were stuck at home. So they came up with a wine delivery service. It's so entrepreneurship. There's so much entrepreneurship around, isn't it? It's just yeah, floating. Yeah. yeah. And, and what about the... Go for it. Another business was Stage Kings, which um, they do big events like Formula One and big outdoor concerts and so on. All their work dried up for the rest of the year because there's no events on. And so they've used their skills and equipment to make desks for people working at home. So really, it's about just considering um, the landscape of what you run and and looking for those opportunities or waiting for them to arrive or grabbing them if you see them and just running with it isn't it um yeah. you said something about the lawyers this morning tell us what's happening in legal land well in legal land they're seeing a lot of people are doing their wills because um well obviously the health issues that have come around with coronavirus and they're expecting to get a lot of divorces come when we reopen everything and people are allowed out of the house again. <laughs> you think actually, with it, isn't it terrible? What a tragedy. All of these relationships are well, going to come to an end. They say that January is their busiest period because when people have had that enforced period of staying together with family over Christmas, they often think, I don't want to do this again next year. So now that they're in a forced lockdown... They're going to come out of the end of it. They're just going to say, no, I'm sorry, mate, but it's just not working. Um, you're talking about, in one of your articles, you started to talk about employment opportunities. Because we, we, we've seen a lot of people lose work and lose their jobs. Mm. What marketplaces are emerging as a result of this? So um, a lot of companies have brought back their call centres onshore. And um, from what I've heard, well, there's Telstra, Optus, there's, um, there's the government with all the calls they're getting about, you know, um, job seeker and job keeper. Um, financial services businesses uh, from insurance companies, um, superannuation businesses, all their call centres are being brought back. So there are jobs there. Isn't that brilliant? I think that's just mm -hmm. amazing. See, there's, uh, there's been some really wonderful things come out of COVID-19. And sure, we can start with divorces and wills because I've, I've got a, a lawyer that comes on the show and she's always, she's got a knife at my throat for me to get my will done. So we're seeing people be financially responsible. We're seeing government finally pay for childcare. Relationships with partners that shouldn't be together are being divorced. Call centres are coming into Australia where we actually really like dealing with call centres at home, don't we? We love the familiarity of having a chat with the person on the other end of the line and knowing that there's an empathetic connection. Um, have you, do you think the government have done enough? Um, well, there are quite a few people that have been left out. So there's the casual workers, um, entertainers, people who haven't been in jobs for more than 12 months who have been left out currently. I think the government needs to maybe look at ways of including those people. But other than that, I think the government has done its best to, you know, contain it and help the economy at the same time. How do we economically recover from this? Um, I guess we start at home and we look to support our own communities as much as we can. You know, those restaurants that are close by that we can patronise again when we can and, you know, buying from local shops and so on. I think for me, that's the best way to start. Yeah, I was talking to a friend of mine. We go, to, go away every year and we go away with a family member and I said, what are we doing? And it's like, well, we're, we're not leaving Australia. We're going to travel around Australia this year. And I, I agree with you. I think we need to consider how we can financially put back into our own country so it will stabilise. Are we going? Do you think we're going to see the level of unemployment that they're talking about? I, I think the job keepers coming in and the job seekers an incredible response to it. Will that save our employment market? 
Um, again, it depends when things reopen and when we can do things. You know, there's a lot of people out there who won't be spending money right now, and that has an effect on the economy as a whole. I think um, it depends how long this goes on. Um, you're getting a lot of inquiries. Your inquiry level gone up. Has your readership gone through the roof as a consequence of this? Yeah, it has. Um, we've had a lot more inquiries about a lot of things that people are asking about. People are also asking, is it time to go back into the market, you know, for investors? Um, you know, there's interest in everything that the government's announcing, you know, try and explain it, whether that's, you know, the tax deductions for working at home, um, how to get JobKeeper, JobSeeker, all those kinds of questions. And people just want to know as much as possible. And even, you know, it's inspiring to read about other businesses that have pivoted and maybe it gets people thinking in a more positive way that maybe there's something that they can do. And I think, you know, even people who have still got their jobs, but their money's been, their, their wages have been reduced, we're kind of learning to live on a bit less. Yeah, do you think we'll come out of this and be more financially sensible as individuals? Will that be the result of COVID-19? <laughs> it's funny, the longer it goes, the better we'll become at that. <laughs> but then it will be worse for the economy as a whole, you know. Um, you know, we look at the frugality of grandparents and, and parents who have been through really hard times and, you know, always managing to have some savings. Um, you know, you look around how many of your friends and family have three months of savings to keep them going. You know, not a lot of us do. So I think that will be one lesson. You know, we seem to spend everything we earn these days. And I think that will have to change. We also spend a lot of money unconsciously, like we'll sign up for Netflix and then we'll sign up for Stan and then we'll get Amazon Prime and we might forget that we can't watch them all at once and maybe we're not using them all. I think this will make us a bit more conscious of everything that we are spending. So we're kind of going to start running ourselves as the essential, only essential spending. So I, I think we did that in my home. We, as soon as Scott Morrison made that announcement, I looked at everything and went, what is non-essential spending? And then I just culled everything. I had um, a gentleman that works in the financial sector on the show, Tim, and he's amazing. He said, you've got to sit down with your bank statements immediately and just have a look at where your money is going. And it's about being consciously aware of your spending, isn't it? Because we kind of do everything so unconsciously. Everything happens on an app now. You buy something, then you buy the entire outfit, then you get your shoes and the lipstick and everything gets delivered. That's going to stop really, isn't it? Yeah, and, you know, I'm thinking, is fashion ever going to get back to the same way? Like, we've all been so casual for, you know, these months. When we go back to work, are we going to get dressed up again? Or is it going to be a whole different style? Like, you know, are men ever going to wear ties again? Who knows? I have loved being able to do interviews at home. Mm. I mean, I miss the studio. There's some really, there's some wonderful things about being in the studio and that connection to... Um, it's just the equipment and that 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 feeling of being, you know, a presenter in a in a radio station. But I'm really enjoying the ability to sit here at home and create this content because I can actually do more content because I'm here at home. Um, do you think the workforce will change? Uh, what will happen to commercial real estate? Because I can imagine that people that are working at yeah. home will be less inclined to go back to the office. Yeah, there will. I think property is an issue that they're really thinking about. Will commercial real estate be the same? Because it's not just people being able to work from home and enjoying it like us, but also the bosses of realising that their workforce can be done like that. And do they want to pay those kinds of rents? Like we in our job hadn't been working from home as a company. And I think this has been a real eye opener that most of our work can be done this way. Um, you know, previously when I was at a large corporate, we did work from home on a regular basis. You know, you might work from home every Thursday or, or whatever it is, but this has been new for this business. And I think it is new for a lot of small businesses. And why would you pay the high rents if you don't have to? That's exactly a way of right. cutting costs, you know. It's really nice not to have to put on a suit and go to a meeting, that I can just sit here and have this kind of connection. And I'm 
I work in the real estate sector. So that's how I'm creating connections with clients from home. And there's something really beautiful about that. So it would be gorgeous to have that continue. Um, oh, I love the voyeurism of it. I love sitting into people's <laughs> houses. It's like when you walk past in winter and the lights are on, you think, oh, they've done a good job. <laughs> Hey, I've just loved interviewing you today. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you for bringing you. your expertise and your, your book. Um, it is called The Joy of Money. Please look for it, everybody. Um, I'm going to have you back on. As soon as something comes up, and I, I, I always say this to the guests that I know have great scope. If anything comes up in your space and you think, got money, need to hear about it, can you just reach out to me and let me know? Because you, right. you will sure. always have a place sure. here at Got Money. Um, Thank you. Everybody, it's Radiothon. Please don't forget to give us your money. We need it. We, it's, uh, somebody said the other day it's $2 a minute for us to be on the air. So please keep us on the air so we can keep delivering this content to you. Be safe, everyone. We're thinking about you. If you have any money topics that you need us to address, please reach out to me at gmtv.com.au or our Facebook page. Take care. <laughs>